Paper was like gold in medieval times. Oh, not tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Rachel Koo, and this beautiful northern city is now my new home. But I, along with most Swedes, often escape to the tranquility of a little cabin in the countryside. Look at that! It's huge! Bit of a mouthful, that, isn't it? My Wallenberger at Burgers. Two waffles ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a pea soup without the mustard. A cake worthy of a celebration, I think. Cheers! Yay! Exploring Sweden and all the culinary delights it has to offer will be the source of inspiration in my Swedish kitchen. Sweden has a long history of preserving ingredients that were available during summer and autumn. Everything from drying, curing and brining to my favourite, fermenting and pickling. It's one of the best ways to enjoy the flavours during the cold and dark winter months. When I walk around the forest, I think, OK, berries, mushrooms, and that's just about it. With your experience and your knowledge, you must walk around and think, yes, I can make this, I can make this, I can do this, I can do this. Absolutely. What really keeps me passionate about my work today is that finding as many tastes as possible with each special plant. And I guess that's the exciting part, is you can experiment and be creative in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Lena Ebbetson is a former chemical engineer who now fully focuses on producing pickles from the forest. Forest has been an important part in the whole of my life. She pickles anything from pine shoots, dandelion sprouts, berries and mushrooms. One of her more famous products is an oil made from spruce shoots, used in fine dining restaurants all over Scandinavia. When you pick, mm. The spruce defends itself and start shooting more shoots from okay. the same point. Yeah. So the more you pick it, yeah. the denser it is, the more shoots we get. All this picking has made me very curious to see what the end product looks like. Let's go. Right, Lena, what are we going to make now? Now we're going to make oil, spruce oil. Lena, what gave you the idea to do spruce oil in the beginning? Oh, um, I started out with the more simpler things, like syrup, and then after a while I got very tired of sweet things. Mm. And I wanted to find a new taste from the same raw material. So I started out with, with oil. I guess it's something which is very natural to people in France. They talk about terroir, mm. about, mm. you know, growing things, and it's really, it really has the flavour of the land, mm -hmm. but it's not something you think of about Swedish produce in that sense. No, that's right. We have never had the terroir stuff. We have more of a survival thing. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. The cold, dark winters it totally makes sense. The best thing with this is you don't need a gym. The colour is amazing. The colour of green is my favourite colour. <laughs> Would you have guessed? <laughs> Thank you. Mmm. <laughs> you really taste the spruce. Mm. Like, it, it's captured that flavour of the spruce just right in that little bit of oil there. And this is... What is this? Try it. OK, all right. Wow! So it looks like an olive. Oh, it looks like an olive. And it has that kind of pickle taste, and, mm -hmm. but there's a, like, a little almond flavour to it. Right. And that's, that's the... This is small plum, unripe plums that wow. have been fermented for nine months. I'm going to have to have another one. It's so You'll good. go ahead. <laughs> Being able to visit and try different produce is a huge inspiration to my cooking. Like my approach to so many different cuisines, I'm not trying to reproduce the exact same flavour, but to put my own spin on the Swedish dishes that I have experienced. Nothing adds a more genuine taste to a dish than being able to cook it in situ. And what better way to make myself at home than cooking in a typical Swedish countryside cabin, or stuga as the Swedes call it. 
It's hard to fake an old style kitchen. The wood burning stove, the smell, the history. To have a cabin is very common in Scandinavia and the home away from home is usually kept as a reminder of how people used to live. This is a place to unwind, to get away from always being on the go, to recharge and remember what's really important in life. Living in Sweden, I quickly discovered this country has an abundance of ingredients from the forest. Berries, mushrooms and game. And my Borboritos is a fantastic way to celebrate these flavours. I'm going to start off making a spice blend. So I've got some onion powder, salt, some ground allspice, flavour that pops up a lot in Swedish food, white pepper, give that a little mix. And then you want to get your boar shoulder, or if you can't get wild boar, just use pork. Pop your spice mix on top and then give it a good massage. A little bit of oil, and when you feel it's nice and hot, then put the pork in or your boar in. You want to sear the meat to lock in the flavours. When you've got a bit of a golden crust, you can turn the meat over. Once the meat is seared, I'm going to add some hot chicken stock. Be a bit careful when you add your stock because it does have the tendency of splashing back. Turn the heat down, a few sprigs of thyme. Cover it and let the magic happen. Basically, you just need to let it simmer until the meat falls away. That's roughly one and a half hours. So these bull burritos are loosely inspired by traditional burritos, but I'm using Swedish ingredients. Firstly, some horseradish. I'm going to add some lovely heat to my sour cream. I'm quite generous with my horseradish because I like it really spicy. I'm going to add a bit of salt. Horseradish cream done. Got some romaine lettuce here. Roughly chop this up. So now let's check on the meat. Have a look. So turn it off the heat. Just be careful, it's a bit hot at this point, so you might want to let it cool down a couple of minutes before you start shredding. Grab two forks, and then you just need to shred it. It should be really easy to do because the meat is quite literally falling apart. This is a great dish to do if you're entertaining quite a few people because you can prep a lot of things in advance and you can just put it all on the table and everybody just helps themselves. One Swedish tradition I discovered from living here in Sweden, which I thought was a bit unusual, was uh, Taco Fridays. It's uh, this thing that Swedes love to eat tacos on Friday. It's a bit like how in England they love to have a curry on Friday. To stop the meat from drying out, I'm just going to add a couple of ladles of stock. I've warmed up some Swedish flatbread in the oven. If you can't get hold of Swedish flatbread, tortillas will work. I have some Swedish brown beans here. So they're slightly sweet, uh, a little bit spicy with cinnamon and allspice, but you could use a tin of kidney beans warmed up, that would work. Just need to plate it up, grab a flatbread. Now it's all about just building your own burrito. Some horseradish sour cream. There's no particular way of doing this. Anyway or anyway. Beans, some shredded meat, a little bit of salad, best of and cheese, or you could use mature cheddar. A few pink pickled onions. The hardest part is wrapping it up. So key with this is not to put too much in it. Otherwise the bread's never gonna wrap around all the filling. Or it's <laughs> better said, it's not gonna fit in the mouth. Mmm, I couldn't think of a better way of eating ball. Flour and bread play an important role in a lot of cultures. Breaking bread is common practice in many societies as a way of forming a bond. It can also be a reflection of the culture it comes from. The durable and convenient Swedish crisp bread, or knäckebröd, reflects the Swedish survival mentality. This mill focuses on making flour from local ingredients, milling old-fashioned grains such as spelt and rye, as well as the traditional wheat. 
The five-generation family-run business also uses an old milling stone to produce a more nutritious whole wheat flour. Wow, what an amazing old mill. So you've got the grains at the top? Yes. And then it then comes, it comes through down, there? Down, down and between yeah. two stones. OK. And then the milling starts work. All right. So how do you get it going? Well, you twist on that wheel. OK. And you have to... Oh, my goodness! I can't do it! Should I you help sure? you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I need to go to the gym more often. This old mill still crushes grain between two stone wheels, installed by Rickard's relatives in 1780. The more modern area was built around the old stone mill. Here, grain is crushed and separated from the husk, then sifted in order to get a completely pure product. This makes the flour extra fine, perfect for making a light and fluffy cake. I see here that, like here, you um, ne'er produce it. So you work with local producers. Um, what are you really proud of in terms of your flour? I don't have any chemicals in the flour. Yeah. It's very natural. So it's just the flour. You're not getting any conservation. Nothing. I love baking, and what I've learned about Swedish food is you love knäckebröd, Swedish mm -hmm. crisp breads. So what flour would you recommend if I was going to make a Swedish crisp bread? Ray. Yeah. Okay. Rye flour. Rye yeah. Flour. And I see you do uh, spelt flour as well. Yes. I love uh, spelt flour because it has such an amazing flavour. <laughs> yeah. It does, and it smells good. Yes. And it's, uh, it tastes very good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. My love for baking with different flours has only increased after visiting the mill. Each flour has its own qualities, like spelt with a light nuttiness and rye with a wholesome fruity flavour. If there's one thing you could always find in a Swedish kitchen, it has to be knäckebröd, Swedish crisp bread. My favourite kind is one made with rye and sourdough. I've got some lovely rye flour here. Plain flour. This balances out the heaviness from the rye flour a teaspoon of instant yeast. And then here I have dried sourdough starter. And the reason I'm using it is for the flavor. It makes it a little bit more complex, a bit more interesting. Teaspoon of salt, about a tablespoon of sugar. And then I want to combine everything together. And then I'm going to add some very soft butter. And finally, some buttermilk. I just want to bring everything together. Press the dough. Right, it's coming together really nicely. Press it into a ball. Now I'm going to pop it in a clean bowl. A little bit of oil in there so it doesn't stick. Cover it up with some cling film and then let it rest for about an hour and a half in a warm spot. The dough's been resting. The reason you want to let your dough rest is that it'll make it easier to roll out. If you roll it out straight away, the gluten is developed and it's, it's just rubbery, bouncy. Dust your work surface and then roll it out. It doesn't really matter if it's not perfect or round shape. I quite like it when it's a bit rustic looking. Traditionally, knäckebröd are about record size and they have a hole cut out in the middle and I always wondered what that hole was. And apparently, it's from hanging them up on a pole from the ceiling. Okay, and now I've got this, um, well, it's not, a, <laughs> it's not for massaging your back. It's actually a rolling pin to prick the dough. But if you don't have that, you can just use a fork. And what that does is it helps keep the knäckebröd flat. I'm going to flip it over, roll the other side. And then that goes into the oven. So you know when your knäckebröd is done, when you have these lovely kind of slightly burnt brown edges and it should feel crisp. I think the best way to eat knäckebröd is to keep it really simple. A few toppings, that's all you need. A little bit of cream cheese. Then I have some pink pickled onions. I always have these in the fridge. 
To make your own pink pickled onions, bring 400 milliliters of water, 300 milliliters of vinegar, 100 grams of sugar, 30 grams of salt, and 20 juniper berries to the boil. Stir and leave to cool before adding 750 grams of sliced onions. Store in a sterilized jar. Some Swedish olives. Oh, they're actually little green unripe plums. A little spruce oil. Swedish knäckebröd, the simplest way to add a little Swedish touch to your kitchen. When it comes to a celebration, you can't beat an impressive cake, but it doesn't mean it has to be difficult. With a few easy steps, you can make your own layered lemon and yogurt cake. First thing you need to do is make some lemon curd. I'm gonna zest my lemons. When you're zesting, you really just want to get the top layer because that's where all the flavor is. Don't grate in the white part because that has a bit of bitterness to it. The lemon zest smells very citrusy. Now I'm gonna juice the lemons. Give them a little roll and squeeze. That helps to release the juices. Really important just to use 125 milliliters of lemon juice. If you use too little, then your lemon curd's gonna to be too thick. If you use too much, then you're gonna have a runny lemon curd. Avoid getting any pips in. Cast the sugar, a little pinch of salt, some cornstarch. That just helps thicken the mixture. And then three eggs. This is the bit where you need to be careful. You don't want to have too high a heat because otherwise you will curdle your eggs and then you get this eggy flavor to your lemon curd. So when it's thickened up, you can take it off the heat. Add some soft butter and carefully stir that in. And now what you have is like a thick, glossy lemon curd. It needs to chill and set. So I'm gonna put it in a jar. Your lemon curd can be made three to four days in advance and kept in the fridge. My yogurt cake recipe is not very complicated at all. Start off with some sugar, soft butter, pinch of salt, and you want to beat that until it's soft. Add one egg at a time until incorporated. Then some yogurt and lemon zest. Plain flour, baking powder. Plain flour and the baking powder mix go in. You just want to fold that through until it's all well combined, but don't over mix the mixture. And then that's going into my lined cake tins. Flatten the mixture. Just want to smooth out the top of your cakes. That goes into a preheated oven at 180 for about half an hour. Now you know when your cakes are ready, because obviously it smells good, but you can give it a little skewer test. It should come out clean. Time for some icing. To make the icing, you need three ingredients, soft butter, icing sugar, and cream cheese. The key to this recipe is super soft butter. Add the icing sugar and start whisking slowly. The secret to good icing is always making sure you whip up that butter until it's a very pale color. I'm gonna add my cream cheese. This is one of my favorite icings to do because it's not too sweet with the cream cheese in it. If you wanted to, you could flavor the cream cheese icing with some spices like cinnamon or cardamom, but I like it plain. Right, that's the icing done. Now I'm just gonna slice my cakes. If you find that it's got a bit of a dome, you can even it out. And then I'm gonna cut it in half. And when the line joins up, go all the way through. I'm gonna put a little bit of icing on the cake stand. This is just to stick the cake down. And then it's just about building the layers and spread it on. Don't have to go all the way to the edge because what will happen is when you put all the other layers on, it adds a bit of pressure and the icing spreads out slightly. I'm gonna get my chilled lemon curd. You can see it's set really nicely. 
again not all the way to the edge and then next layer last bit of lemon curd that goes on top now if you wanted to you could leave it naked this would be a naked cake or you can do it semi-naked which I'll show you how to do now Okay, so this is a semi-naked cake, and if you wanted to, you could just decorate it with some flowers. But if you want a very nice finish, what you need to do is put it in the fridge for 30 minutes for the icing to set, and then do another layer of icing. Last layer of icing. This cake is not for the faint-hearted, especially if you're intending to be on a diet. Forget that. I don't do cakes by half measures. To get a really smooth finish, you want to dip your palette knife into some boiling water. You could simply leave the cake like this or add a bit of decoration. I've got some rosemary here. I'd say less is more when it comes to decoration. A cake worthy of a celebration, I think. The Swedes are not ones to boast about their traditions. My lemon and yogurt cake with its simple flavours is an understated way to enjoy the Swedish tradition of fika. That time of day to sit down for a coffee and a slice of cake. Not too dissimilar to the British tea time. It has been an inspirational start to learning more about Sweden's food culture and I look forward to discovering many delicious delights this country has to offer.